the talk today is a little bit different from the talks that I usually do. So most of my talks is about the small bowel microbiome and all the details about the small bowel microbiome. And when Dr. Pimentel invited me, I immediately accepted. He invited, was like, okay, do you want to give a talk in the microbiome course? I said, of course. I know everything about the small bowel microbiome. Then he told me, no, it's not exactly the small bowel well, microbiome, so I want you to talk about the sulfate-reduced bacteria. And then I accept again because I said, okay, this is one of our interests in, in the lab. We have been doing a lot of research with H2S producing bacteria, and I decide to give this talk to you. So, but then when I start to look for the background to give you some information about SRB bacteria or sulfate-reducing bacteria, I realized that actually I know nothing about them. The first review paper about this type of bacteria, this group of, of bacteria, it's 1965. The review, not the papers itself. And I said, oh my God, I have so many things to talk about it in 45 minutes, so let's try to do it. So the sulfate-reducing bacteria, they are a unique group of anaerobic bacteria that use inorganic sulfur substrate, or sulfate, as the final electron acceptor during anaerobic respiration, and produce hydrogen sulfide, or H2S, as the end product. So the SRB constitute one of the oldest form of bacterial life on Earth and they can survive in a broad range of environmental conditions such as extreme pH, like extremely low or high pH, or extremely low or high temperature and salt concentrations. So we can find these bacteria in shallow marine sediments or even in deep, uh, deep su subsurface, like in volcanoes. And that remind me of what Dr. Knight uh, said this morning, do we need to go that deep to find these bacteria? Actually, no because these bacteria also survive in our gut. So it's easy to analyze them. So in the most common of S SRB are from the class Delta Protobacteria. I will show you more details about these groups of bacteria so you can visualize better. But basically we have seven classes of uh, microorganisms where they can produce H2S using sulfate as substrate. And one of these, let's try to point out for you here, this is the mouse, yes. So we have basically five class that it's from the bacteria kingdom. Okay, it's not working well, let's try here. Yes, and we have two classes of microorganisms that actually is from Archaea. But since we know that the sulfovibrio, that's one of the, the genus from the Delta Brooke Protobacteria class is the most important one in human, in the gut uh, microbiome, so we put on focus in disulfovibrio for now. But we do have several other microbial taxa that are, they are not sulfate-reducing bacteria that produce H2S from other sources, as such taurine degradation of cysteine or sulfate organic compounds, and I will talk a little bit about them as well. So our first reports about SRB in the gut microbiome, the human gut microbiome, was with studies with fecal, uh, fecal samples. And in fact, this is the microbiome profile of fecal samples, human fecal samples. And as you can see, this is the sunburst diagram of the microbiome profile in these patients. And what I want to show you is exactly where we can find these microorganisms in this microbiome. So as you, Dr. Mathur already explained to you, these sunburst representations uh, show you the microbiome profile starting at kingdom level and going down to species level. So I want you to focus your attention in the protobacteria phylum where we can find most of the SRB microorganisms. But more than that, it's not all the classes inside protobacteria phylum that have representatives that produce H2S. Actually, we are talking about delta protobacteria that represent less than 1% of the microbial profile in fecal samples. And as you can see, we do have the sulfovibrio right here that produce H2S using sulfate 
but we also have other microorganisms that I will show you later that produce H2S but using another source. But what about the small bowel microbiome? We have a lot of study with fecal samples, but later on we have been understanding a lot about the duodenal microbiome. And basically, I want to show you the same, where in the duodenal microbiome we can find these microorganisms. So let's take a look in this same phylum that is the protobacteria phylum right here, and let's expand the delta protobacteria class, that is a very small class that represents less than 1% of the protobacteria phylum in the small bowl. And let's take a look where we can find the sulfovibrio. So the sulfovibrio is just this much. The sulfovibrio represents 0.01% of the total delta protobacteria that we can find in the small bowl microbiome. Most of the bacteria that produce H2S using another source is Bilophila, and we will talk about these microorganisms later. Okay, next one. So initially, these bacteria were treated as biological curiosities, and little research effort were devoted to them until 1940. And that happened because H2S can it's a very active gas that can react with iron and cause a lot of damage for industry. And since those industries, especially the offshore oil industry, have to handle with this problem, they start to put more research, more grants and money in this type of microorganism. And what we found after all this time, that only after 1996, we observed that H2S actually is not only important for biotechnology, but also for humans. So in 1996, H2S was for the first time established as a biological mediator. So we know now that the H2S is not only a toxic gas, of course, so we do have very small amounts of H2S in our body that will act in some way. So not only in pathologic conditions, but also, also in healthy conditions. So we will now skip a little bit about the talk in the biotechnology side. I have no experience with this. So let's go and talk about the H2S and the impact that we have in human health in disease. So we know that H2S have impact in several biological systems, such as nervous system, cardiovascular, and also the immune system. And because of that, change in levels of H2S can also change the intestinal motility can change inflammatory response, and we have studies that connect this type of bacteria and maybe as etiology of bowel disorders such as inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome, and of course, colorectal cancer. But more than that, uh, at the point that we understand how H2S is important in several processes, we have been linked these bacteria that produce H2S to other diseases, such as obesity and metabolic syndrome. And this is very important because, at, I will show you in the previous, in the, the next slides, that these microorganisms have a close relationship with methanogens. And as Dr. Pimentel explained well, methanogens are associated with obesity, and some point in some studies also shows that SRB can also be associated with obesity. But how that relationship happens that can explain both of these microorganisms that in some way are competitive in this em environment can trigger or change metabolic pathways and people developing obesity or other diseases. So, but first I want you to understand how the production of H2S happens because understanding the pathway, we can understand how these bacteria will work together or not. So most of the SRB, like the sulfovibrio, they produce H2S using sulfate as the substrate right here, yes? But sulfate as substrate needs a donor, an electro donor, and the donor that, that these bacteria us usually use for the production of H2S is hydrogen, as pointed here. But more important, that hydrogen is not the only one. Even SRB, 
uh, microorganisms can use lactate, formate, and acetate as uh, electron donors for the production of H2S using sulfate as substrate. And this is very, very important. And so the sulfate that usually we need to break down or to eliminate from our system, they come from diet. And we do have, of course, some sulfate that come from our whole cells, but most of the sulfate comes from the diet. But let's think about hydrogen, lactate, formate, and acetate. Most of these compounds, they come from metabolism of bacteria. So hydrogen, we know that we have bacteria fermenters that during their res respiration, they produce hydrogen for uh, uh, carbohydrate metabolism, but they also produce lactate, formate, and acetate. So in some way, even if we do have other bacteria growing together, we know that this relationship between them is very important because without the production of H2 or even acetate, formate, or lactate, SRB cannot survive. So there is a relationship, very close relationship, an important relationship of this bacteria with hydrogen pr uh, producers, but also those bacteria that produce lactate, formate, and acetate. So, and we know a lot that the hydrogen also have an impact in some other groups of bacteria because they try to compete for this molecule. As Dr. Fremantel mentioned, Hydrogen is full for production of methane, we know that, but also full for production of, in this case, H2S. So we do have methane uh, producers that are competing with SRB uh, bacteria as well. But I want to add one more group of bacteria in this balance that usually we don't talk about that much and we should now in the future. It's the acetate producers. So acetate producers also use hydrogen to produce acetate as final product. And just remembering, acetate also can go to the pathway for more production of H2S by SRB. So it's an eternal cycle that if you, and if you have an imbalance of these bacteria in your gut, maybe these levels will change and will impair human health and be associated with disease. So, but as I told you in the beginning, the production of H2S is not only through the use of hydrogen or even lactate or formate. We do have other microorganisms that produce H2S using um, the sulfur, like the sulfate from other compounds such as taurine, cysteine, and, and these microorganisms, they are very important for human health. And as I told you, uh, we will show a little bit more. Let me go back to the previous slide. I pressed up, yes. So delta proteobacteria was the one that have a lot of disulfovibrium and bilophila that can produce H2S using sulfate. But we also have bacteria from the same phylum, from proteobacteria, that produce H2S using taurine or even cysteine as Electron as electron receptor. So, and this is very important because in some of our patients that they do have increased level of H2S, it's not all the time that we also observe increased level of the sulfovibrio. So we know that there are other microbes that can be associated with this production. And what I want to show that these pathways they that we believe that we were the responsible ones to to provide, to, to do this metabolism, actually bacteria can also do. So L-cysteine is one amino acid that usually we can metabolize, and we do have enzymes that metabolize this amino acid, but we know already that some bacteria that have the cysteine, the sulfohydrase, can also hydrolyze cysteine and release of H2S. And this enzyme is very common in some bacteria species in the colon, including Clostridium, Enterobacter, Klebsiella, Streptococcus, Desulfovibrio, again, and Tisserella. So now we learn that the Desulfovibrio use H2, acetate, formate, lactate, and cysteine. So basically, the Desulfovibrio can produce H2S using any source. Plus, we do have these bacteria that can produce H2S in using amino acids. 
More than that, we observe that fusobacterium, that is a very important pathogen in, in the human context, have at least four genes which encode for different enzymes contributing for the production of H2S. And in fact, fusobacteria can produce H2S. We do have some isolates. We are trying to grow these isolates in our, in our lab, and they produce H2S, even uh, having only cysteine as source. And we know that L-cysteine can also be converted to D-cysteine. And in the intestine, it's considered to be small, but the D-cysteine can interfere with the metabolism of L-cysteine. And several bacteria have the capability to metabolize this cysteine And one of them is Creeca coli, that we know that's very abundant in the human GI tract. And also Fusobacteria and Fus Fusobacterium vario and Fusobacterium suci that produce the cysteine uh, the cysteine enzyme releasing pyruvate during metabolism, ammonia, and also H2S. So, but where, again, we can find these microbes in the large intestine and also in comparison with the small intestine. So again, we are talking about the phylum proteobacteria. So let's go back. So we are talking about this phylum in orange. So this is the microbiome profile of the small intestine, and this is the small this is the microbiome profile of the large intestine. As you can see, the proteobacteria in the small intestine is more abundant. It represents around 18% of the total bacteria that we sequence in this environment. Compared to the large intestine microbiome that represented by fecal samples, that represents around 5% only. So we are talking about also fusa bacteria that in the large intestine represent less than 1% of all the microbes that we isolate in fecal samples at the mouse, it's not truly working. But on the other side, in the small intestinal microbiome, fusobacteria represent 5% of the total relative abundance, and these bacteria can produce H2S using cysteine as substrate. But also we have the production of H2S from taurine, that's another amino acid. And what we know that taurine is converted to secondary metabolites that can be done by Escherichia coli again. And these secondary metabolites can be, again, metabolized to a final end and produce an H2S by Bilofla warstorfia. Warstorfia, yes. And this intestinal pathogen use this enzyme to produce H2S. And this is very important because when we compare the small intestinal microbiome with the large intestinal microbiome, we observe that these microorganisms, okay, sorry, I forgot about this. We also have some papers showing that SRB microbes, including the sulfovibrio, can produce H2S using taurine. So basically, the sulfovibrio can use all SIRs to produce H2S. In the beginning, we didn't know that. So looking again to the microbiome to check where we can find these bacteria that use the taurine, again, we are looking to the proteobacteria phylum. And what I want to show you that is very important, that in the small ball, the most important microbe from the delta proteobacteria class is Bilophila. And Bilophila is the one that uses taurine for the production of H2S. And if you look, and to the large intestinal microbiome, to the large intestinal microbiome represent, represented by fecal samples, we do have the sulfovibrio, but a lot of bilophila as well. And more than that, in some inflammatory process, we do have some pathways like the metabolism of tetrathionate that can be done by E. coli again, and also Pseudomonas, Salmonella, Protease, and Citrobacter, they can break down this molecule and produce H2S. So under inflammatory conditions, we do have bacteria that can metabolize this uh, molecule and produce H2S in certain conditions. And again, these bacteria is from the protobacteria class. So you heard a lot of this class in this talk today, and, and in fact, they are very important. As we know, proteobacteria have a lot of pathogens that have clinical uh, implications. And when we see that these bacteria, they are so ad 
adaptable, they, they can produce, they can survive even if the environment is not the best for them. This raised like a red flag for us that maybe we should take a look in different conditions. Usually when we grow E. coli in the lab, we grow in E. coli in aerobic conditions. We are not concerned about putting these microorganisms in anaerobic conditions or restrictive conditions. And that's why usually we don't see these bacteria producing H2S and we don't give them this importance that we now should give. And, and as you can see, I wanna show you a very like simple comparison about the amount of enterobacteriaceae that we have in the small bowel comparing with the large intestine. And actually in the small bowel, 9% of the protobacteria phylum is comprised of enterobacteriaceae, of the enterobacteriaceae class where we can find E. coli, salmonella, proteo, citrobacter, and all of them. And in, this, in the large intestine, it's only 4%. But I, I want to give a, a different perspective and talk about absolute abundance because in the small bowel, we have less bacteria, usually 10 to the third CFU per ml, when it compares to the large intestine that is 10 to 14 CFU per ml. So in the end, these 9% represent less bacteria, these bacteria that produce H2S, than in the large intestine. So, and why we have been studying H2S that much? So as I told you, we we, after 1996, we observed that H2S, it is a, a biomarker, can be used as a biomarker for inflammation in some conditions. And also, it's a molecule that have rules, like in some pathways, including modulating LTP in neurons or regulate smooth mu muscles, and other processes such as angiogenesis mitochondrial functions, and also cellular, cellular bioenergetics. So, and then endogenous HOS is found in various tissues, such as the central nervous system, liver, kidney, cardiovascular system, lungs, and gastrointestinal tract. And HOS was initially considered as an only a neuromodulator, but an endogenous HOS also performs all other roles in many uh, physiological process, including angiogenesis, as I told you, citrus protection. And because of this, chains in the levels of HOS can also improve or increase pathological processes. So more than that, when bacteria produce HOS, they become resistant to antibiotics. So and this is very important for us because if we see that our E. coli that we believe that was not producing H2S suddenly starts to produce H2S or the same with Klebsiella or even Fusobacteria, we know that they have a resistance for the broad spectrum antibiotics. And of course, we do, we do know that we have biological roles of H2S in the GI tract that is associated with relaxed ileosmooth muscles or increased colonic secretion and protects intestine from ischemia and reperfusion in injury. And this is very interesting because we do have this beneficial side of H2S, but when it's completely imbalanced, H2S produced by this bacteria in the GI tract is genotoxic and can trigger inflammation. So we have several studies that connect the H2S with inflammatory bowel disease and also color cancer, the colorectal cancer. But this is not yet proved. Unfortunately, we do have studies that connect the production of HOS in, in these conditions, IBD or colorectal cancer. But also we do have studies that show no association at all. So we do have one of these studies right here and they observed that SRB had no effect, this one, in patients with IBD when compared to controls. And also in colorectal cancer, they observed that SRB can have actually a cancer suppressive factor. So we do have the two roles of H2S, so that's why it's so hard to study because we believe that we are talking about levels and when you change levels, you change the role of this molecule. So in summary, I, this is very interesting slide because I want you to open your mind and understand how we produce H2S, where and what to expect 
when we do some tests in, this, in our patients, so such as the breath test. So the H2S that is produced in the gut uh, needs the substrate, the sulfate. So sulfate usually comes from the diet, as I told you. So you eat, you provide sulfate to the, your microbiome, and they start to metabolize and produce the H2S. But believe it or not, 70% of the H2S produced in the GI tract comes from L-cysteine. It's not even from the sulfate from diet. So thinking about this, if it comes from L-cysteine, 70% of H2S, who is probably producing this H2S or where? So if we think about that H2S that is produced in the large intestine where we can find more of the vibrio, so probably the HUS that we're producing there comes from the hydrogen production as well. But if you look to the small ball and check the H2S that have been produced in the small ball, we don't have that much sulfovibro there to use h 2 to use hydrogen, but we do have bilophila, we have E. coli, Klebsiella, Fusobacterium that use L-cysteine, taurine to produce H2S. And this H2S can be absorbed by the epithelium cells. Okay, where is it? Can be absorbed by the epithelium cells. And this H2S can be also used to produce sulfate. So we have a cycle of even H2S as gas that will be uh, used for these cells and for the production of sulfate that will be used again for the production of mucus and released in the gut. And again, this bacteria will have a new source of sulfate and produce more H2S. But part of H this H2S goes to the blood circulation. And so that's why we can check the H2S in the lungs during breath tests. But what, I, what is the lesson from here is when we do breath test, so this is the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. Yes, so when we do breath tests in these patients, we are providing to these patients a, s a substrate, a carbohydrate, sugar. So, and we know that the carbohydrates are broken down, we break down by primary fermenters. So, even the, the amounts of short-chain fatty acids, so, such as acetate, propionate, butyrate, and gases, that's H2 and CO2. And we know that the, if we have SRB microorganism in the gut, they will use this hydrogen as electron donor to produce H2S using sulfate as substrate. But when we do this test, we are not providing the patients amounts of cysteine or taurine. So the, the, the H2S that we are checking, the breath of these patients, they come only for microorganisms that produce H2S using hydrogen the sulfovibrio. And if we don't have the sulfovibrio, probably the breath test would be negative, but is this patient truly negative or because we are not giving the right substrate during the breath test? So, and, but even so, that's very important because this whole story about H2S being important in several conditions came from our studies where we checked the levels of H2S and we did association with GI symptoms. And what we observed that patients that have more severity, like diarrhea, they had more H2S in their breath test. So, and what we observed as well, that even like more severe, these patients also have more urgency with bowel movement using a threshold of 1.2. So, but we also do have patients with diarrhea that don't have H2S in their breath test. So probably we need to think about new tests to check to provide them maybe cysteine or taurine and check how they are producing this H2S by microorganisms that are not our SRB, but maybe the SRM. So in conclusion, H2S is important, it's important in the breath testing and correlate with patient symptoms. 
And H2S is exhaled in the breath we can use and is a potential biomarker for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Why? Because these bacteria that are associated with SIBO, we know that they are also proteobacteria, they are fermenters. They will metabolize carbohydrate, will release H2, and this H2 will be used by SRB and production of H2S. And that's it. Thank you very much.